Welcome to the Waiting Warriors podcast. As loved ones of first responders and military personnel, we often face life situations and challenges that many others don't experience. And while each of us and our experiences are unique, together we can learn from one another and become stronger in this journey of life. Now let's step out of mediocrity. It's time to thrive. Hey, Waiting Warriors out there. Welcome to another week on the Waiting Warriors podcast. My name is Michelle Bowler. I am your host. Today, we have an amazing guest. I'm super honored to have her on the show. This is Dr. Ingrid Herrera Yee. And welcome to the show, Ingrid. Thanks for having me. Got to read off all her stuff because I don't want to get this wrong. Ingrid is the senior social scientist at Defense Suicide Prevention Office. She's a military spouse of over 12 years, married with three kids, one in college, two with autism. You, you're quite the lady. Yeah, I'm an autism mom, yeah. You're quite the lady. So <laughs> um, let's just get this rolling. Why don't you tell us kind of your story and experience as a military spouse and how that got you to where you are today? at the defense, oh, I already- Suicide Prevention Office, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All good, <Yeah>. it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you say the whole thing, Department of Defense Suicide Prevention Office. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. have an acronym? But before, but before I get started with everything, cause I'm gonna talk about all the things, um, mm -hmm. Everything I say today, I'm not representing the Department of Defense. I'm not representing the Department of Defense Suicide Prevention Office. I'm not representing Booz Allen, who I'm a contractor for. This, this is me, military mm -hmm. spouse who's been in the mental health field for almost two decades uh, and really, really passionate about saving lives and really, really passionate about mental health in our community. Mm -hmm. And so this is as me, uh, my opinions, alone um, and experiences and, um, you know, based on my work, based on losses that I've experienced in my own life, losses we've all experienced in our community. Um, so everything I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be so, so totally real. Um, I'm not gonna, I could talk to you cause I'm a stats geek, you know, about numbers, things like that. But I really want tonight to be more about, you know, getting real about mental health. Mm -hmm. and about, you know, suicide prevention. Um, and my journey here, um, I was one of those lucky ones. I knew in high school that I wanted to be a psychologist. So I went straight to school, you know, I got my PhD and then met my husband. Uh, and I was actually going to join the military, um, really? join the army as an army psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband was a recruiter who talked me out of it. <laughs> he talked me into marrying him instead. No so, way. Yeah. <laughs> that was so good. So, you know, I figured, well, then I can save, you know, lives in our military community in different ways. Maybe not as a military psychologist, but, you know, in my own corner of the world as we move around as a military family. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what got me specifically into suicide prevention, it's, it's almost like one of those snapshot moments moments that you just don't forget. You're kind of frozen in time. I was at a, um, I was a doctor's appointment and I was just sitting there. You know how they always have like CNN or something in the background when you're at a doctor. Yeah. Um, so I just happened to be looking and I think it was somewhere around 04 or 05, somewhere back then. Um, and they said there were more military service members who had died by suicide then KIA, then killed in action. And it just, it hurt, you know, I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So I did not join, you know, um, as, as a military psychologist, but what can I do? How can I help? How is this possible? Yeah. How is it that we're losing more people, more of our family, more of our friends, more of our, you know, community to suicide? Um, you know, to me, it's like KIA, they're just slower death, you know? Um, so, you know, they, these are all casualties of war as well. Um, just much more painful and less predictable, yeah. but preventable. That's the good thing. These are preventable, right? Mm -hmm. So 
that was really the beginning of my journey um, because I, it was, I really wore that on my heart. It was, I really wanted to make a difference um, and I really didn't know how. So back then um, there was already a lot of wonderful military spouses, service members, um, nonprofits in this space trying to make a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like, you know, what can I do? Why don't we, you know, we've got numbers for veterans. We've got numbers for service members. Why don't we know anything about our military families? Because I personally at that point had known military spouses and military kids who had take, sadly taken their own life. So I was like, it's not possible that, you know, the number's so small that we're not counting them. Yeah. What's going on? So back then um, was really the beginning of my advocacy work. So I spent a lot of time writing and calling and visiting, you know, the halls of Congress, um, really just as a spouse, not representing any organization, not really knowing many other spouses in the community. I was a newer spouse at that point. Um, so I, I didn't know how to start, what to do. I just knew that we needed these numbers because as a researcher and a psychologist, I knew that only way that we could affect change, the only way that we could help our military families is if we have numbers. Because yeah. without numbers, we don't exist to Congress, yeah. right? They need numbers in order to act. So I was like, okay, this is like my number one. I have to get these numbers. Um, and through the years, I started meeting other amazing advocates out there, um, volunteering with the National Military Family Association and Blue Star Families and other organizations trying to get these answers and hitting walls all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know, doing clinical work where I could. So I was on the front lines, you know, trying to help service members and their families get through difficult times to prevent suicide mm -hmm. uh, and to increase help seeking and to talk about mental health and staying mentally healthy. Um, and so, you know, at that point I, in my career, I was very much on the front line. Um, but as luck would have it, we started moving around more, right? And the license issues back then weren't a big, uh, we didn't have a lot of help like we do now. Yeah. We had no help. Um, so basically I was unemployed and underemployed with my doctorate for a really long time. So I just took whatever I could get. You know, I was like, I'm volunteering all over the place. If it had mental health in it, I was there. I was volunteering with, you know, nonprofits. I was volunteering um, to do like social media marketing with behavioral health, curriculum design. And I was an adjunct professor a few times. I volunteered to do research with established professors in communities where we were living um, to try and, you know, at least add to the literature add more knowledge around, you know, military families, service members, veterans, because at that point there was still a divide. Uh, mm -hmm. but there still is now, but it was bigger. The military civilian divide was pretty big. Um, and I felt really alone and isolated. So back to sort of my own journey where I decided, you know, I need to meet other military spouses who are in my field. I need more boots on the ground. So that's when I decided, you know, I'm going to create sort of this little grassroots group on Facebook, uh, Military Spouse Behavioral Health Clinicians, mm -hmm. back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And it was basically a space like no other at the time um, where spouses who were either interested in or already in mental health fields could connect, network, share information about licensure, uh, share, inf share information about, you know, how to get into online schools, which back then there weren't many in mm -hmm. our in our field, um, volunteer opportunities, um, cry, you know, a shoulder to cry on, um, someone to share, you know, the fact that this stinks, that I, we can't find jobs, we're underemployed, unemployed, we're getting into schools that are predatory, you know, like, so all kinds of information that we were sharing back then. So then that became part of my journey. It was this grassroots group that then I turned into a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. support other military spouses in this field so that now we had lots thousands of boots on the ground um, around the world um, at this point, CONUS and OCONUS, um, who are making a difference in their communities 
on on their installations um, and you know also fighting the good fight you know first of all supporting our families of course is a big part of it but supporting our community the mental health of our community um, because it's clear that nationwide mental health we've got a shortage of providers there's a crisis but it is particularly poignant and important within our own community um, and I figured you know We've got all these military spouses, military girlfriend, girlfriends. It's we don't discriminate. You know, fiancés, veteran spouses, who um, have lived the life or are living the life, they get it. Who better to, to be there as a counselor, therapist? You know, um, the face that you see across from you as a military spouse or as a service member who gets your lifestyle because they live it too, right? Yeah. Um, so I love our fellow um, clinicians who are civilian. Uh, we need them too, but our spouses are un unemployed, you know, and underemployed. Um, and they, you know, they are passionate about our community. So wanting to make a difference, wanting to, to be there. Um, and so I had this group and that connected me with a lot more of the nonprofit world, boards, things like that. Mm -hmm. And one day when I was sitting on a board, uh, the Military Family Advisory Network, um, we had a visit from uh, Dr. Keita Franklin, who at the time was the director of DISPO, Defense Suicide Prevention Office. And talk about, you know, putting it sort of out there in the universe, what you want to see happen. Mm -hmm. After she spoke, I was so moved. And I was like, oh, my God, I wish I could work there. I'm going to work there. I'm going to work there someday. Right. Yeah. And, and fast forward, like two and a half years after she she I saw her mm -hmm. speaking to our group and I had left NMFA, I had gotten a job through uh, Booz Allen as a contractor. And I moved them from um, Real Warriors campaign where I did, you know, breaking stigma around mental health and a lot of frontline work with military families at Yellow Ribbons, like National Guard families in reserve before deployments. Um, an opening came up at Dispo. That's awesome. And just, I swear, it's like kismet. The year that I that I did that I just slid into that position was the first year that we started working on getting those numbers for military families. I had goosebumps. I mean, it was talk about you know living your passion, your dream, and then having it all like come together in your career. So I was no longer underemployed, and I was living my dream. What I put out into the universe was happening. I was yeah. like, oh my god, I'm actually writing and doing the research and doing the analyses with this big data to come up with this very first report to help assist with it, um, where we're actually getting these numbers for our military family um, suicides. I mean, it's a difficult topic, but we have to talk about it. Yeah. Um, you know, because if we don't talk about it, you know, if we reach one person, just one, you know, who, who gets to know that it's okay not to be okay, that, you know, gets to know that, um, suicide is preventable, that there are people out there who are going to help, who are going to listen. Um, you know, that is huge. It's huge. I feel a huge responsibility every day going, going to the office, uh, working on what I work on, seeing the things I see, hearing the things I hear. Um, and for me, it's a calling. Mm -hmm. Like I want to save lives. That's the bottom line. Um, is it tiring? Is it it's sad, you know, some days are harder than others, but um, I really feel like our community needs this. Uh, you know, they need the support, the resources, the information, and to know, especially our service members, that, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to affect your career. Mm -hmm. There are ways to do this um, where you can continue on serving. Um, and especially families, when they say they don't want to affect their service members' careers, so they don't want to get help, they need to understand that it's not going to do that. There's confidential help now um, because we've listened over the years. We've listened to families and service members saying, I don't care what you say, DOD, we're afraid, you know, yeah. that it is going to affect our career, yeah. that there is going to be an impact. So now there's a lot of resources that, that don't track that, you, you know, that you're getting help. And there's policies being written now as I speak around taking away um, even command possibly knowing 
that anything is going on. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes trying to change policies to make it easier for those in service to seek help. Yeah. You mentioned like the some of those resources that are available that are confidential. What are some of those just in case people don't know what they are? Mm-hmm. I know way back when people were like, oh, military one source. <laughs> it has it, you know, even I used to have issues with military one source. I would call and I just felt like no one, you know, I wasn't getting what I needed. But oh, my gosh, it's amazing now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can seek help and um, it's easily accessible and it's free. Then you've got organizations like Given Hour who have volunteer clinicians. Um, I am on their advisory board as well. Uh, you've got volunteer clinicians at Given Hour. Mm-hmm. Um, who are available for free um, wow. to counsel families and also confidential mm-hmm. um, and not connected to DOD. And then you've got, um, of course, your crisis lines. Um, they're also confidential, the military crisis line and um, the veteran crisis line mm-hmm. and the suicide help line, which also is confidential. And then um, <clears throat> One that I've found that a lot of families are using now is MFLEX, so Military Family Life Counselors. Okay. They're on installations, and yeah. that's they're confidential as well. Yeah. They don't keep uh, records. They don't write notes. Um, so for non-clinical counseling, they're amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're also available for your children, so not just yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so MFLEX are awesome. And then you've got your chaplains. And chaplains are also confidential. So there's so many and they're getting trained like part of my department we are training chaplains on like suicide prevention directly Mm -hmm. they're getting trained and um, more comfortable with asking those questions Um, so all of these resources are available and there's so much available um, for our families and our service members um, to seek help where they don't have to worry about you know some sort of paper trail you know or or any consequence uh, to their seeking help. And of course, you've got your network too, hopefully. And it's important to have like a network, friends, families, fellow service members, fellow military spouses, uh, fellow military families, your FRG, your key spouse. You know, you've got all these folks that are ready, willing, and able to step in and help. Mm-hmm. People just have to take that step to actually say, I'm not okay, I need help. I have a question with that. What would you say to somebody? Cause I hear often like, you know, I have my friends, they maybe have somebody that they maybe could talk to, but everybody else is okay. So why am I not okay? I should be okay. Not like they won't understand, but like if they can be, you know, we're, we're army. So like if they can be army strong, then I just have to be army strong. Do you know what I mean? Like how, how do you help people in our community, like bridge that gap between being a strong military service member and family and right. supporting spouse. And it's okay to ask each other for help, right? Like mm-hmm. we all know how much, how hard this is. Yes. Yes. We do. Uh, we understand. And that's one of the downfalls to this whole, you know, I'm arm, we're Army too, Army mm-hmm. strong or resilient yeah. and all that um, is, you know, that's why the messaging of it's okay to not be okay is so important because you gotta remember a lot of what we see is like people's highlight reels. I know I don't put out there when I'm having a hard time. You know, we're, we're putting out the very best of the best with, you know, filters and all. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, so, you know, we're trying to look our best, sound our best, show our best. Um, and so it's deceptive. You know, everyone is, is, has their own sort of battles to, to wage. Everyone has their own, um, you know, issues and difficulties and sadness and anxieties and losses. Um, we're all going through something. Um, and, you know, even the people who you think look all perfect and their life looks perfect and they look so strong, oftentimes they're the ones that are suffering the most. They're just really good at hiding it, you yeah. know, not showing that. Um, and that's why, you know, 
again, it's okay to not be okay. You need to talk about these things. And don't be afraid to ask someone, you know, gosh, you know, you used to be a lot more active online. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Uh, I heard, you know, your spouse deployed. What can I do for you? What can I do for the kids? You want me to babysit, you know, or uh, you want an, yeah, I'm here, a shoulder, an ear, you know, anything you need, anytime. Um, you know, just really reaching out and trying to be comfortable asking the difficult questions. You are not going to cause someone to be suicidal by asking about whether they're feeling suicidal. It's a huge myth. The research says that talking about suicide does not cause suicide. It actually, it, it's a relief and people want to talk about it. Uh, they may not in that moment, but they will know that you noticed that you cared and they may come back to you when they're ready to talk about it. And you could actually save a life because they say that it can happen in a split second, that decision yeah. that is, they can never reverse again. Um, you know, that decision to take their life. So it's important, you know, for those people in your life to know that, you know, if, if you feel like, you know, are you, you know, have you thought about, you know, I'm really concerned about you. Have you been thinking about taking your own life? You know, I'm here, you know, I've had my own struggles or, you know, I lost my sister or, you know, whatever it is, you know, you could say, you know, it's okay. Um, I'll be here. I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning, you know, call me, um, talk to me. Let's go out and get a coffee, you know, and just talk. Um, it's really, really important for people to know that, that they can reach out. Um, and that's why, you know, it's one of the biggest protective factors for suicide to have a support network mm -hmm. of any kind. Mm -hmm. So is that what you would say? Just like, like, would you just point blank say, have you thought about suicide or would you just say, are you okay? I'm concerned. I hope you know that I'm always here for you, you know, come mm -hmm. two o'clock in the morning or whatever. Well, that depends you on your comfort level. level. I remember when I was a new counselor, it was so hard to ask that question. Yeah. So I can certainly understand if someone who's not even in a, a therapy kind of field to be uncomfortable saying that directly, mm -hmm. but you could and know that it's not gonna cause them to be to, to, oh to die by suicide or to attempt. What it's gonna do is is let them know that it's a, you're a safe person to talk to about this. But you don't have to say those words exactly. You could say, like you said, I, you know, I just want you to know I'm here. I see that you're struggling. I see that you're having a hard time. I want you to know you're not alone. Um, you know, you want to talk. If you need something, you know, look, let me just babysit. Um, you go out, you know, you know, clear your head, you know, go go out with your husband and, and or, or wife and go get a coffee. I'll stay here with your kids. You know, don't worry about it. Um, I'll throw in a load of laundry. You know, whatever it is, you know, to help out. You know, mm -hmm. do that. It really depends on your comfort level, but it's important to know that just saying the words, you know, are you thinking about, you know, harming yourself or about suicide? It's not going to cause harm. Yeah. Because there's the whole like, I don't know, I feel, I feel like it would be hard to say those direct things because mm -hmm. I know sometimes I, I'm more comfortable than like maybe other people are or something um, just because, you know, like I am a chaplain's wife, like I've talked with families and, you know, I'm not doing my husband's job, but like helping people through their problems is what our family does. Absolutely. But I, yeah, I just think it's so important and good for us to just say like, I'm here, like, yes. And I don't have a problem with you coming to me about this because yep. yeah but even even though I am like more in this world than maybe most people it still is it would be so hard to look at my friend and say like are you hurting that much mm -hmm. like that, I think because even for me like you just kind of get choked up you don't you don't want your friends to be hurting that much you don't want to say it out loud because then it makes it a possibility but it is comforting for me to hear like i'm not putting that idea in their mind or i'm i wouldn't be i wouldn't be making the problem worse i guess it, right. which is something i've i've thought of and yep, has kept it 
question. Yep. That's good to know. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, another question I have for you, because obviously like th this has been a problem, particularly in our community for decades, right? Mm -hmm. And I know it hasn't always been um, talked about the way that it should. And I feel like we as a community and the military is getting better. But at the same time, I do, I also know that a lot of people are like, okay, well, we've had programs before and the military has a million programs and yes. those soldiers go to tons of briefs and it can, it can start to feel like, okay, it's just another briefing, you know, that yeah. we have to sit through. Oh, yeah. So two questions is like, one, do you feel like things are getting better? And two, if not, is there something that we as a community can start doing instead of waiting for the military to come up with? As I've been talking about this online, a number of people have said like, yeah, I wish the the DOD would have be talking about it more or have better programs or whatever. And I just keep on getting the thought of like, I don't have the time to wait mm -hmm. for some big program to come up from the top. Like, like we we've lost too many soldiers. Like I, I know people who we've lost this year at our base. Like why, why wait? So yeah, those, those are my two questions. Sure. Well, the first question, um, are things getting better in some ways? Yes. In some ways, no. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. In terms of there's more, um, it's more acceptable to seek help. You've got leaders who are speaking out more about seeking help. Um, we've got numbers that are very public. There's more transparency. Um, so we're, we know a lot more of what's going on behind the curtain, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and people are more comfortable asking for help than they were in the past, but not enough. Yeah. So that's what I meant. What kind of yes, kind of no. Mm -hmm. Not enough people feel comfortable enough yet to seek help. They, like I said earlier, they still feel like there's going to be a career impact. A lot of the research says that um, service members are really concerned about being perceived as broken by their peers or their leadership about, um, you know, thinking that they are weak uh, themselves because a lot of, you know, the training is about being mentally strong. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if they are feeling sad, depressed, anxious, a lot of that self-blame, self negative self-talk about, you know, what's wrong with me, I'm weak, right? Okay. So there's a lot of that that still, is going, still happens. Mm -hmm. There's fears around security clearance, um, especially once you get into the higher levels. How is this going to affect things? Um, you know, is it going to get taken away because I'm seeking help? So there's still a lot of that stigma, um, sadly. But it is better than it was, but it's not where we, we need to be, mm -hmm. right? There's still, I mean, one suicide is one too many. Yeah. Um, and, you know, our suicide rate has been steadily climbing over the past five years. So it's not getting better in terms of the numbers. Is that because more are being reported? Part of it, but I think that uh, we could do better. Yeah. And we're trying. Because the thing with suicide is that it is a multifaceted issue. There's not like one risk factor yeah. um, or, you know, one protective factor. There's like a myriad of things. But the good news is that um, this year's um, annual suicide report, because it just came out last week, um, oh. is showing that, um, you know, we are establishing uh, program evaluations. So uh, uniform, like DOD wide looking at the programs that exist, creating pilot programs um, and testing and evaluating them for their effectiveness. Are they making a difference in the lives of everyday service members, particularly our 17 to 24 year old enlisted young guys and gals who are at highest risk? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, are we making an impact? We're testing that now. Is it, and if we find a pilot program that's making an impact, uh, we're working towards making policy so that it is available DOD-wide, mm -hmm. all services. So the services are on board. 
you know, we've got very dedicated, passionate individuals who work with all of the services. You know, you've got the chaplaincy, you've got your suicide uh, program, uh, prevention program managers, SPPMs. You've got all of these people working hand in hand, trying really hard every single day to support. Um, so know that there are people daily. I mean, this is our passion. Our life is trying to save lives in our military community. So that is good news. It's moving in the right direction. Um, second part of your question was around resiliency. Uh, no, that was earlier. Well, just, just what can, what can we do instead, you know, cause like, that's awesome. I love that that's happening and so many things are happening, but what can we do instead of just like, okay, well, hopefully there's a pilot program. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. What we can do now is, um, is community. Um, because really the biggest protective factor is having someone to talk to, yeah. having someone to reach out to. And that's why right now we're really concerned about COVID because we are all at home. Most of us are. Um, so that sense of community is sort of shut off, not just in the military community, worldwide, not even the U.S. Um, so finding a community online, finding a community locally, finding people to talk to that you connect with, um, like MSBHC, my organization, it's a community, you know, so we connect and we commiserate, you know, finding something like that, um, where you have something in common or, um, fellow military spouses, for those of you who are military spouses that are listening, you know, finding other spouses in, in, in your area or with different, same interests, um, you know, just making sure that you are connected, connection, human connection, um, is the best thing you could do uh, for, you know, to prevent suicide because isolation, loneliness is a killer. Yeah, it really is. Um, you know, if you have a faith, you know, whatever your faith or spirituality is, you know, that's a great also way to connect. Um, moving, you know, um, getting physically fit, um, eating right, you know, just taking care of your mind and body. Um, I know they're very simple things and they can really apply to a myriad of mental health uh, concerns, but it works as, as well with um, suicide and suicide prevention. But I think the biggest thing is trying to help with um, safety uh, around lethal means so that if there is a hard day, if there is substance misuse going on, that your firearm is locked um, and it's not loaded, um, you know, so you've got your your weapon locked up. You've got your ammunition somewhere else, you know, separate. Um, you've got your medications that are that could be dangerous locked up. Um, so really being safe in your home so that if there is a moment where, um, because they say it's in a moment where someone makes that decision, if they don't have access, it's easy. The research says that they don't just go and find an, a, a an alternative. You're not, if, if you have it in your mind that you're going to, this sounds horrible, but um, if someone has it in their mind that they, they've they planned that they're going to die by suicide via firearm, if they don't have access to that firearm, they don't go and substitute something else. Okay. So, you know, really restricting access, and I'm not saying taking it away. Um, I'm saying, you know, making it safe, making your home safe. Um, making your home safe from anything that could potentially be used to take your life. Cause it might not even be you. It might be your kid. Mm -hmm. It might be your wife. It might be your husband who in a moment of weakness with, you know, a cloudy minds, depression, um, alcohol that decides I can't do this anymore. And then there's no return, especially if you're talking about a firearm where it's the most lethal means of suicide. You don't come back from that. There's no rescue from that for the most part. So there's no time to change your mind. You know, it's an irreversible decision in so many ways. So, you know, making sure that your home is safe uh, from, from these lethal means of suicide, making sure that you have connections, that you're taking care of your mind and your body and, um, you know, reaching out and talking to people these are all together the very best ways that you can support each other and, you know, help someone and prevent suicide. Mm -hmm. We're working, you know, on a, on a pretty much, you know, public health level, which is, you know, societal to change things. Um, 
but it also takes your everyday, you know, connections to each other to yeah. save lives. Yeah. And just us talking about it. You know what I mean? Talking about it is crucial. Yeah. Like all September on Fort Campbell, there were, oh, what do you call them? Like those sign things, you know, like how politicians have those signs that go in the ground. Yeah. Yes. So you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. so all over post though, they had um, just the purple ribbons and like September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month or yep. um, they have like little quotes and stuff. Like that's awesome. And I love that they had that all over the place because it got me thinking about it. My daughter, um, she read it and then that brought on a conversation between her and I and she's only seven. So that was like, oh, I don't want to. They're like even know what it is but you know it's a topic we have to talk about so i love that they had those but i think it's super important for us inside the community to be saying things on social media or you know we're not having the in-person conversations but any any communication that we do have that we're that we're talking about it and we are saying those messages of it's okay and look out for each other. Yeah. Like I said before, if you've noticed that someone's dropping off when they used to be a lot more interactive, you used to see them a lot more, you know, reach out and ask why, or ask if they're okay. They might be okay, but they might not, you yeah. know, and they will really be appreciative that you reached out. There, there's, you can't go wrong by just checking in on people. You just can't, you know, I mean, the worst that will happen is they're like, I'm fine. Like why, what's up with you? you know? <laughs> That's the worst that will happen. It's not, you know, so, and the best that will happen is that they will be extremely grateful and they will talk about how they're having a hard time and how you saved their life just by talking to them and being there and noticing, you know, so it could be very simple, just like that, Yeah. you know, one person to another. Yeah. And as you say that, I think it's so interesting how, I think sometimes I'm even guilty of this, like I want there to be a big thing that we should do and that it will save everybody. But then you who is like a professional and knows what will work says it's simply reaching out to people. It's taking care of our community. It's, um, you know, like, I mean, taking care of ourselves, but then also just looking out for the people around us. And yet, we don't do those things, but we would show up for some fundraising event or we would, Mm -hmm. um, you know, change your Facebook picture to, with the flag, you know, how they have those, like whatever movement is going on. Um, And not that that's bad, but like, we're so, we're so willing. And we say that we're so willing and ready to do those bigger things, but we'll really work is these smaller things. And I know as, as you've talked, I've had to like check myself of, okay, like I'm, I am saying that I am passionate about this, right? Like I've put time and effort into this whole podcast series, but how often am I checking on the people in my neighborhood and making sure they're okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a really, really good, good check. And light bulb that's going off in my brain and hopefully hopefully. others yeah yeah so thank you for coming on the show and sharing i particularly loved hearing those resources because some of them i hadn't heard because i like you know we do we hear of military one source um whether it has a positive or negative connotation in your mind Mm -hmm. hopefully now it's positive but those other (laughs) those other resources are good too and it's it's good to hear that um, you know, you guys are working so hard to change those barriers that we're trying to find. Yes, yeah. we're trying to find every day solutions. You know, trying to trying to find a way to save lives. And you know, but also part of this work is realizing that you can't save every life. But God, I'm going to try. Yeah, I'm going to try every day. That's awesome. You guys are awesome. So last question, because yes, you are an expert in suicide and we have benefited from that, but you're also a military spouse. So what would you say is your key to thriving that you'd want to share with your fellow waiting warriors? 
Okay. Well, for me, it is that community that I've been talking a lot about. So reaching out, um, I am often a mentor um, and a speaker and, you know, a SME in my community, but it's important for me to have a mentor of my own and to have friends that I can go to, um, not just to be there for them, but there for me too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's all about those connections, being with my kids. My kids are on the autism spectrum, but they've got the biggest heart in the world. And they bring out the joy and peace. Um, and it's just love and, oh, my God, you know, just connecting to um, to things that make your heart sing. You know, that's how I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll dance and sing in the car to 80s music as I'm stuck in horrible traffic in D.C. And I'm happy even in horrible traffic in D.C. because I find these small ways to connect with my inner child with my heart songs, you know, and just try to be happy because there's a lot to be grateful and thankful for. We are so fortunate in this country to have so much. There are struggles and I read about them every day in the reports that I have to read that are really hard to know and read about. So self-care, 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 you know, connecting, all of that is is what keeps me thriving and going. I don't think I could, no, I know I would not be able to do this work if I didn't have that in my life. I, it would burn out city, yeah. So if you wanna help others, just remember to help yourself too. You know, find what makes you happy, find that joy. For me, it's that 80s music. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I feel like this was really helpful information for me. I'm sure so many other listeners out there. Um, Guys, I really want to challenge you to do two things. One, reach out to somebody around you. Make sure you're checking up on your neighbors. But then also, two, put the crisis hotline numbers in your phone. That's something that I realized as she was sharing those, like we see them all the time. They're shared on Facebook all the time, but I think we need to have them in our phone. So then they are accessible in those actual crises and we can send them to people if we need to. Um, so those are my two challenges. Check on, check on your community, check on your people, check on the people who maybe aren't in your immediate social circle but your physical circle too and thank you again Ingrid this was incredible all you waiting warriors out there remember just because it's hard doesn't mean it has to be miserable and have a good week friends if you are loving the content here and want some more waiting warrior action check us out at instagram or facebook the handle is the waiting warrior no s or check out the website the waiting and make sure you get on our mail list we have some really awesome things coming up have a great day